For places that exist to heal you, it's surprisingly easy to get seriously unwell during your stay at a hospital. It makes total sense if you think about it. This is a place where hundreds or even thousands of sick and contagious people converge, coughing, sneezing, touching everything, and leaving surfaces covered in infectious fluid traces invisible to the naked eye. If you're really unlucky, you might even get an antibiotic-resistant superbug like MRSA, as well as a hefty medical bill. If this is making you even more nervous for your next hospital visit, don't worry. There there's an answer to this age-old problem, and that answer is copper. The problem is pretty much no hospital actually uses copper alloy surfaces. Let's take a look at the incredible antimicrobial properties of this often overlooked element and why it isn't being used everywhere. Copper and humanity go way, way back. The humble metal was actually the first to be manipulated by humans, with copper objects having been found in the Middle East dating as far back as 5100 BC. During the early days of the United States, the penny was made out of pure copper compared to the largely zinc-based copper alloy we use today. It's the third most used metal in the entire world, and for good reason. It's malleable, making it easily shaped, and conductive. And that's why it's a mainstay for wires and pipes, as well as in agriculture and even in some forms of birth control. The other medical application of copper was stumbled upon for the first time in the modern world in 1852 by French physician Victor Burke. He was visiting a copper smelter in Paris's third arrondissement. The process of smelting, by the way, is extracting pure metal from ore using extreme heat. Burke was disgusted by the factory conditions, which he found to be laughably poor. The average mortality rate of the factory workers at the smelting facility were described as pitiful by Burke. But he was there to do more than just insult the factory. He'd noticed a fascinating pattern that emerged in recent years. Paris had fallen victim to numerous deadly cholera outbreaks throughout the 1800s. The disease had struck with devastating effect in 1832, 1849, and 1850. 52. But in every case, people who worked in copper smelting factories exhibited far lower infection and death rates than the general population. Dr. Burke found that their shared occupation was the common denominator here and wanted to investigate further. If you're like us and you've been digging into epidemiological history, you probably immediately think of the smallpox outbreaks of the 1700s. Doctors found that milkmaids who'd previously suffered from cowpox experienced far lower smallpox infection rates. They discovered that this was because the antibodies developed from cowpox infections reinforced the immune system against smallpox. Much like the milkmaids, several hundred copper workers from this same facility managed to completely dodge the cholera outbreak that was ravaging those not lucky enough to work with scalding hot metal all day. So Dr. Burke expanded the purview of his study and found that this trend echoed across many professions that involved working with copper. This included goldsmiths, boilermakers, jewelers, and even musicians in brass bands. He caught on to a major finding here. In the cholera outbreak of 1865, yes, Paris had a lot of cholera outbreaks, roughly 3.7 out of every 1,000 people died. For copper workers, the percentage was far lower, with only 0.45 out of every 1,000 people dying from the infectious disease. Being surrounded by copper and covered in copper particles had kept the workers safe from infection. Dr. Burke had come to a truly incredible conclusion. After carrying out this same study on over 400 businesses and around 200,000 people across Europe by 1867, he presented his findings to the French Academies of Science and Medicine, saying copper or its alloys, brass and bronze, applied literally and pregnantly to the skin in the cholera epidemic are effective means of prevention which should not be neglected. And Dr. Burke was absolutely right. They didn't have the technology at the time to fully understand the process behind the phenomenon, but applying copper did indeed protect the copper workers from infection while everyone around them was falling ill. And what's truly crazy is copper had actually been used for medical reasons thousands of years prior. The Smith Papyrus is one of the oldest written records available, and it recorded people using copper to disinfect chest wounds and drinking water between 2600 and 2200 BC. Warriors from ancient Egypt and Babylon had the exact same idea, using copper shavings from their weapons to disinfect wounds on the battlefield. They had no earthly idea why, but they were aware that this marvelous material could save lives from deadly infection. And now modern science is here to tell us exactly why this is. Copper's antimicrobial properties come from its ionic disposition. When a foreign organism, like say a bacterium, lands on the surface of the copper or one of its alloys, the bacterium recognizes the copper ions as an essential nutrient and thus begins to absorb them. However, as more and more copper ions enter the cell, the ionic dose becomes lethal. These levels of copper ions prove dangerous to the bacterium, as the influx of ions destabilizes the cell's electrical microcurrent, also known as 
has the transmembrane potential and effectively short circuits the bacterial membrane. This destroys the integrity of the membrane and allows more copper ions to flood into the cell, seriously affecting the cell's ability to metabolize and ultimately killing it by destroying its DNA and RNA. It can sometimes even achieve this process in mere minutes, and the list of microbes it can kill is truly impressive, including MRSA, E. coli, norovirus, coronaviruses, and antibiotic-resistant strains of staph. Copper is a hardcore microbial murder machine. When traces of a bacteria or viruses are jettisoned out to the air by, say, a cough or a sneeze, they can remain on regular surfaces for even several days after the initial contact in the right conditions. A careless touch of the wrong surface can put your health in serious jeopardy. On a copper surface, however, the microbes rarely live long enough to do any harm. Michael Schmidt, a professor of microbiology and immunology at the Medical University of South Carolina, believes that using copper in hospitals and high-traffic areas like public spaces and public transport can prevent countless infections. One in 31 people in hospitals in the US end up contracting healthcare-acquired infections. There are around 36 million hospitalizations every year in the US, meaning implementing copper in hospitals could potentially prevent hundreds of thousands of healthcare-acquired infections every year. Increasing the use of copper in our hospitals and public spaces wouldn't even really be a step forward, but kind of a step back, as copper was actually used far more frequently in the past. As a holdover from this time, the handrails at the New York Grand Central Station are still copper, saving millions of commuters and tourists from infection. Would it really be so hard to bring it back everywhere else, especially considering all the good it would do? Professor Schmidt isn't confident that hospitals will take this life-saving step due to upfront costs. When asked why hospitals transitioned out of using copper in the first place, he said, what happened is our own arrogance and our love of plastic and other materials took over. We moved away from copper beds, copper railings, and copper doorknobs to stainless steel, plastic, and aluminum. Many commercial entities have taken advantage of copper's efficacy as a disinfectant, though, selling everything from copper-based hand sanitizer to copper-based underwear. Copper surfaces feature 90% fewer microbes than almost any competing material. So why have the world's governments fallen behind on this, when the threat posed by global pandemics is greater than ever? As alluded to earlier, the greatest barrier to installing copper everywhere is cost. Installing copper on only 10% of the most at-risk surfaces in a hospital costs around $52,000, and with over 6,000 hospitals in the US, the cost will quickly add up. However, Professor Schmidt argues that looking at costs that way is the wrong way to go about it. The overall costs of yearly healthcare-acquired infections in the US are truly devastating. 99,000 deaths every single year are related to healthcare-acquired infections, and the costs of treating all the infections are between $35.7 and $45 billion annually. Let's run the numbers on this. The cost of treating the average healthcare-acquired infection is around $28,400 to $33,800 per person. Professor Schmidt and his associate Bill Kievel found that applying copper to 10% of surfaces in a hospital over 338 days led to 14 fewer infections than normal. Even at the smallest estimate for the cost of a healthcare-acquired infection treatment, which is $28,400, the installation still paid for itself around 13 times over, saving a total of $397,600. You can't argue with those results. With those numbers, it's safe to assume that if the percentage of copper coverage was elevated above 10%, it would save even more money, and more importantly, save significantly more patient lives. Changes as small as copper bed frames and copper door handles have proven to tangibly reduce the rates of healthcare-acquired infections in medical environments. And while copper, like all elements, is an ultimately finite resource, it isn't as though we're gonna run out anytime soon. According to Copper Alliance, there are currently 830 million tons of copper out there, which if used continually at our current rates of copper consumption, will continue to supply us for 46 years. Though in actuality, we'll have copper supplies for a lot longer, seeing as copper is one of the most recycled metals in the world. Also, copper seems to never actually lose its antimicrobial properties. Even when it oxidizes and takes on a green color, which means yes, the Statue of Liberty is still germ-free and going strong. An investment in copper is a lifetime investment, and as the study from Kievel and Schmidt already proved, copper installation would theoretically pay for itself within two months. Some people are thankfully paying attention to the incredible antimicrobial properties of copper surfaces already. Chilean theme park Fantasilandia has adopted copper for its most touched surfaces across the park in hopes of reducing the spread of disease. If you have kids or no kids, you'll know that they touch every surface around them and then immediately stick their hands into their mouth. Copper surfaces could really help curb the potential infection vectors in theme parks, so Fantasilandia is really getting out ahead of the curve. Airports are also coming around to the idea. The Atlanta Air 
airport fitted 50 water bottle filling stations with copper in order to prevent microbial residue from repeated uses from endangering any airport customers. Employing this and more copper surfaces at various commercial and public places would likely help curb public infection rates. Had copper been introduced to public and hospital environments earlier, it's even been speculated that some of our current viral troubles might have been reduced, though nobody can really say for certain. To answer our first question, seeing as copper is such an incredible antimicrobial wonder, why aren't hospitals using it? Like a lot of the world's greatest evils, the problem at the root of all this seems to be misinformation. According to Professor Kievel, when doctors think of antimicrobial metals, they most commonly cite silver as the most practical choice. This, however, isn't the case. Not only is silver more expensive than copper, it only has antimicrobial properties when wet. Copper doesn't require any additional treatment to have effective antimicrobial qualities. Many also theorize a shallow a reason behind the world's reluctance to adopt copper as a common surface metal, it's a lot harder to keep looking nice than steel, plastic, and glass. Copper can tarnish and lose its coloration over time, but it cannot lose its antimicrobial qualities. People like Professor Schmidt, Professor Kievel, and now probably you can only hope the world's governments get over their aesthetic-based metal discrimination and change their minds. Now go watch What If Ebola Infected the Entire World, and disease that turned 5 million people into living statues.